It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. In 2014, taxpayer-funded research and polling leaked in the media had this to say. Most Ontarians would not support the provincial government selling a controlling interest in any of the five Crown corporations tested. Three years later, most people don't support the Liberal short-sighted Hydro One fire sale. Mr. Speaker, it is not too late to do the right thing. Will the Liberals finally commit to stopping the fire sale of Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would just say to the uh, to the member opposite that uh, you know we made a very conscious decision not to do what that party had done with the 407, Mr. Right. Speaker, because there was, a, no, there was no benefit to the people of Ontario by that fire sale, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, the decision that we made about building transit and transportation infrastructure in this province was premised on the understanding that Ontario's economic well-being is at least in part dependent on having the right infrastructure for right. people to be able to move around, yeah. for goods to be able to move, Mr. Speaker, and there had been decades of neglect in terms of building infrastructure in this province. We're catching up, Mr. Speaker. We're doing it in a responsible way, and we're seeing the fruits of those investments Answer. as Ontario leads economic growth in this country. You see it, please. You see it, please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. The government asked the people of Ontario, do you support selling Hydro One? And the answer was a resounding no. And so the question, Mr. Speaker, that the Premier needs to answer is why spend hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars on Liberal research firms if you're just going to ignore that advice? Do hundreds of thousands of dollars, do millions of dollars, taxpayers' precious funds Order. mean nothing to this government? Why spend that money? Why help your friends in Liberal research firms if you're just going to ignore it? It's not right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, um, there are, there are uh, many, many issues that uh, that government has to make decisions on, Mr. Speaker, and it was fundamental to our understanding of the e economic needs of this province that we invest in infrastructure. And by infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that means transit, it means roads, it means bridges, it means hospitals, it means schools, Mr. Speaker, it means infrastructure across this province. $160 billion over 12 years is being invested in this province, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, the fruits of those investments are being seen, Mr. Speaker. We have in Ontario created 702,000 new jobs, net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, since the recession. Yes, that job creation, Mr. Speaker, is connected to the investments that we have made and the economic growth that we have seen. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I asked a serious question about Liberal research being ignored, Liberals patting the backs of their friends. Okay, both sides, that's enough. The member from Leeds Granville is not helpful. And also, I'll make mention of the fact that while someone's putting a question, I'm hearing heckling on the same side, and when someone's putting the answer, I'm hearing the heckling on the same side. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, the fact that this Liberal polling is being leaked to the media in itself is interesting. That means at least one Liberal wants to do the right thing. At least one Liberal recognizes the fire sale of Hydro One is short-sighted. Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to know, and, and hopefully the Premier can tell us, which Liberal leadership candidate is the one that leaked this to the media? Because the official opposition, Mr. Speaker, would like to thank that Liberal for doing the right thing. To the Premier, who leaked this to the media? Mr. Speaker, you know, there are, there are huge challenges facing governments uh, in 2017, Mr. Speaker. There are issues that have importance for the future economic uh, well-being of this province, Mr. Speaker. And if the Leader of the Opposition is saying to me, Premier, why don't you just govern according to the polls, I think that gives us an insight into his Remember method of— 
Mr. Win. Speaker. What we do on this side of the House is we measure and weigh all of the alternatives, Mr. Speaker. We take input, of course, from polling, but we take input from business, we take input from economists, we take input from people, Mr. Speaker, and then we make a decision that is going to be in the best yes, interest of this province. That's what we've done. That's why we've made investments, and the economy is going be seated, please. Be seated, please. Before I move to the uh, new question, the member from Leeds Grenville, I uh, indicated to you that uh, I, I acknowledged you just to make sure that you heard it. And you were working on the second one when I stood up, but you didn't get it. And that goes for anybody else. If you want to elevate this, um, I will lower it. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We know this Liberal government has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, nearly a million dollars, advertising their hydro Hail Mary that is very partisan. Mr. Speaker, how much have they spent advertising the damaging effects of the fentanyl crisis in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the, the member opposite has raised uh, a couple of issues, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the opioid crisis that we are uh, seeing in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and quite frankly across the country. We take it extremely seriously. We understand that there is much that needs to be done. We have, in fact, put in place an opioid strategy, Mr. Speaker, but uh, as I said a number of weeks ago, we know we need to work with municipalities to make sure that municipalities have the tools that they need and that those, uh, those supports are in place. So we will continue to work, Mr. Speaker, to enhance the strategy that we already have in place, working with other jurisdictions and learning from the work that they have done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. I have to confess, I already knew the answer. The answer is the government spending nearly a million on partisan hydro ads and almost nothing when it comes to the crisis we're Chief facing. Government They've whip. spent barely anything to warn Ontarians about the dangers of fentanyl. Mr. Speaker, why are these vanity ads, why are these partisan liberal hydro ads more important than letting the people of Ontario know about the dangers of the fentanyl crisis? Please. 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 Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care uh, wants to speak to the investments that we are making, but I really need to comment on the juxtaposition of these two issues. I understand that the Leader of the Opposition feels that um, that this kind of political rhetoric is helpful in terms of, I don't know what, maybe his political future. But, Mr. Speaker, the fentanyl crisis in this country, the fentanyl crisis, the opioid crisis in this country is extremely serious. And all of us should rise above the pettiness of this kind of juxtaposition of issues to focus on what is really important. Mr. We're now moving to warnings. Clear? Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. A 14-year-old just died because of this crisis. The Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, the OPP, the Ottawa Public Health have all launched some form of an awareness campaign, but crickets from this government. Stop. Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned. A lethal dose of pure fentanyl is as little as two milligrams, the weight of 32 uh, grains of table salt or even seven poppy seeds. Preventable deaths are happening 
across this province tragically. Mr. Speaker, there is a limited advertising budget the government has. Right now, it's being spent, according to the Auditor General, on self-congratulatory ads the government, partisan Liberal Hydra ads. My question is very direct and clear to the Premier. Will you stop the Hydra ads and put every cent into this fentanyl crisis? It's right there. Thank you. Premier. Health and long term care. Excuse me. Excuse me. Mr. Speaker, the opioid crisis uh, in this country is something that I think all of us here in the legislature appreciate the seriousness of and that we need to take those important steps to save lives and provide the supports that our, particularly our community partners need to be able to address this crisis right across the country, Mr. Speaker. And that's why it's so important that uh, in this province, uh, last October, we addressed this in a multifaceted way. In fact, I had a meeting just uh, a few days ago with the Chief Medical Officer of Health beginning in April 1st uh, of this year, Mr. Speaker. On a weekly basis, all our hospitals, our public health units, the Ministry of Health will have real-time data in terms of the scope of this problem, of the, of the deaths and the overhead that, that take place. We're expanding the pain clinics in this province to 17. We made naloxone available free of charge through pharmacies and through public health units. Mr. Thank you. Some individuals are tiptoeing very close. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Since the Liberals got elected, hydro rates have gone up over 300 per cent, and this, uh, since this Premier took office, they've gone up by 50 per cent alone. Speaker. It's a startling fact, but more startling is what, is actually, uh, the, what this actually means to Ontario families. It means more people than ever are being forced to choose whether to pay their hydro bills or to put food on the table. When will the Premier do more than buy radio ads and issue press releases as her response? to this crisis that her government has created. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, we recognize that electricity prices, that hydro prices have been a burden for people uh, in all corners of the province, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why, on top of the 8% uh, that we already have uh, cut people's bills by, another 17%, so a total of 25% uh, people people will see that reduction mr speaker on their uh, on their summer bills but mr speaker we started in 2013 recognizing that we needed to take costs out of the system we've taken a number of actions mr speaker but we realized we realized that even with the accumulation of actions that we had taken in 2013 and 2014 and 2015, that more needed to be done. That's why our plan will take 25 per cent off the bills of everyone who, in their home, pays their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, people who live in more remote yes, and sir. rural areas will see another reduction, Mr. Speaker, that could take them up to 40 or 50 per cent reduction. Supplementary. Speaker, does the Premier realize that time of use billing is a big problem for many Ontarians? For a parent who's raising kids, it means you can't cook dinner at dinner time. It means you have to stay up really late at night to do the laundry. And that's just not right, Speaker. Can the Premier tell us, since she refuses to release the details of her Band Aid hydro fix, will it include ending punitive time of use pricing, Speaker? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today I have in front of me the technical briefing that was provided to all of the critics of all of our opposition parties in the media, Mr. Speaker, and it talks specifically about many of the actions that we're taking as a government to reduce the bills of all families, small businesses, and farms across the province, Mr. Speaker, up to 25 per cent um, for all families, Mr. Speaker. They're going to see that reduction come summer. Uh, also, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to time of use, we're also having pilot projects that are being looked at right now, Mr. Speaker, by our system operator, by the OEB, that are talking about ways of ensuring that we can continue to find ways to help families and businesses, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is a substantial plan that is bringing relief to families 
families, Mr. Speaker, unlike the opposition yes, party, Mr. Speaker, that has a bumper sticker plan that does absolutely nothing to help families and low-income individuals right away, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, people need information from this government, not a slide deck that's provided to media and opposition critics. Shame on you. Ontarians need to know what this plan will actually do. Ontarians need to know that, Speaker, so that they have some certainty around the future. The Premier needs to release the, member from Durham is the details of her plan in this legislature so that it is available for open and transparent debate. Instead of playing a game of political smoke and mirrors and spending public money on partisan ads. Enough with the PR speaker. When will Ontarians see the Premier's actual plan? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's been well said. The details of our plan, 25 percent reduction for all families in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And for those families, Mr. Speaker, for those families that are in northern Ontario and rural parts of our province, Mr. Speaker, they're going to see more than just 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've actually reduced the distribution rate, Mr. Speaker, for Hydro One customers and seven other LDCs. They will see reductions, Mr. Speaker, between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Speaker. And that's thanks to the action of this government, Mr. Speaker. We've made sure. We've made sure, Mr. Speaker, as well, that we are looking after low-income individuals, our most vulnerable, Mr. Speaker, and our First Nations, something that they didn't even include in their plan, Mr. Speaker. We've made sure that we've enhanced the Ontario Electricity Support Program. And for our First Nations on reserve, Mr. Speaker, they will see their delivery line reduced as Thank well you. and eliminated. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for a Premier. Unfortunately, the people won't see a plan from the Liberals anytime soon by the looks of things. Look, the privatization of our hydro system began under the Progressive Conservatives, and clearly the torch has been successfully passed to this oh, Liberal government. Champion. But overwhelmingly, the people of this province, an overwhelming majority of Ontarians, have made it clear that they want a public hydro system. When will the Premier finally listen and stop the sell-off of Hydro One? So, Mr. Speaker, again, I, I completely understand why the leader of the third party would want to talk about this, because she actually has a plan that would increase or do nothing to reduce people's uh, electricity bills. Her proposal would either keep electricity bills at the same cost or increase them, Mr. Speaker. And the issue that she, uh, that she raises today, the broadening of the ownership of, of Hydro One would not take one cent of one person's electricity bill in the province. Member from Hamilton East Stony so Creek is warned. We, we made a very difficult decision around the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One in order to build the infrastructure that this province needs, Mr. Our Speaker, in every corner of the province. Infrastructure that will allow people to move themselves, their families, their goods more quickly, Mr. Speaker, and will allow this economy to thrive. Yes, That's sir. the decision that we made, and we're seeing the fruits of that. That, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Having said that, we know electricity bills have to come down, and we've Thank got the you. plan that's going to do that, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, for such a studious Premier, it's quite shocking and surprising that she has not obviously read the NDP plan that's apparent through her response. But I can tell you this a quick shot in the arm for a political part. Please finish. But I can tell you this, a quick shot in the arm for a political party and a leader that's struggling with low popularity should not be the driving force behind the creation of public policy in the province of Ontario. The Premier and her party congratulate themselves regularly on their evidence-based approach to policymaking. Can the Premier tell us where is the evidence that continuing the wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One born. will be good for families or businesses? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our, 
Our fair hydro plan is based on reducing people's electricity costs, Mr. Speaker. That's what it's about. And as I said earlier, we began in 2013 to take costs out of the system, Mr. Speaker, to renegotiate contracts because we knew that there was a need to reduce those costs so that electricity bills would not go up as, as quickly and as high. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, we recognized that there needed to be more done, and that's why we made the decisions that we've made. In fact, I have read the NDP proposal. Mr. Speaker, and I know that what the NDP proposal will do is make people wait for any change, will not reduce people's electricity bills, and in some cases, Mr. Speaker, will actually increase their bills. That's not a proposal that we would adopt, Mr. Speaker. We're going to see electricity prices come down in this province come the summer, all across the province. Well, Speaker, the reality is nobody trusts this Liberal government, and you can see why. You just have to go to the internet, read our plan, and know that you can't trust what comes out of this Liberal Premier's mouth. The NDP plan to lower hydro costs by up to 30 per cent is being debated in this House this afternoon. Unlike this Premier and her party, we're not afraid to give Ontarians detailed plans or take bold action, like doing what people want and bringing Hydro One back into full public ownership. Will the Premier stop her wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One, agree to start fixing the systemic problems in the system that started with them as it continuing with them, and actually support our plan, which is the only plan that addresses the systemic problems, Question. gives people relief on their bills, and is, in fact, the only plan on the table. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. So, let me just say back to the uh, let me just say back to the leader of the third party. I think it would be very helpful if she would, would explain to the people of Ontario how one cent would come off one electricity bill if we made the changes she's suggesting about hydro one. I'd like the leader of the third party. The leader of the third party is warned. Premier. Let me ask the leader of the third party why, in her proposal, there is no mention of First Nations, whereas in our plan, Mr. Speaker, we're actually removing distribution cost delivery charges from uh, First Nations communities, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like, furthermore, I'd like to ask the leader of the third party why she would make low-income. Uh, users of electricity in the province wait, Mr. Speaker, why she doesn't have a plan that would That's be right. immediate for low-income users, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we did a lot of work to come up with proposals that actually would lower people's electricity prices, Mr. Speaker. That is not what the NDP has done. I understand why they want to talk about Hydro One and why they want to talk about their proposal, Mr. Speaker, but the fact is that what they're Answer. proposing will not reduce people's electricity bills. Ours will, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We're going to go with our plan. Your no question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, yesterday we learned of the approval of a $100 million GO Transit station in the Minister's riding of Vaughan. This, despite government's own expert analysis indicating that the station would mean longer travel times, force current GO passengers back onto the road, and result in a $143 million loss. Mr. Speaker, was the station approved because the minister put his interest to see a Premier Del Duca nameplate uh, ahead of the interests of Ontario uh, and GO riders in the province? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the question. I'm, uh, I'm always delighted to have the opportunity to stand uh, in my place in this House and talk about the incredible plan that our Premier and our government have to invest in and expand public transit in every community, uh, not only in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, but right across the province of Ontario. Speaker, I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, local individuals who have been working hard, including my mayor, Maurizio Bevilacqua, uh, John McKenzie, our Commissioner of Planning, uh, uh, City of Vaughan, uh, Ward 1 Councillor, 
uh, Marilyn Iafredi, who have been working very hard for a number of months with the folks at Metrolinx to make sure it's clearly understood that over the next 10 years, approximately 35,000 people will be moving into the area wow. immediately adjacent to where this proposed GO station will be, be, will be built. Speaker. This is a clear indication that our government understands the importance of building public transit not only to meet the demands of today, yes, but for the demands of tomorrow. Speaker, and we're going to continue with that job. Exactly. Speaker, the station is right in the minister's backyard. In fact, the government's own business case stated, quote, the benefits which could be realized by a Kirby Vaughan station are not large enough to outweigh the anticipated negative impacts to go transit and the economy. So I ask again, why does the minister seem more interested in his backyard station to boost no. his own political fortunes than in the best interest of transit riders here in the province it? of Ontario? Very interesting. Minister? Yeah, Speaker, look, I, I, I want to follow up by saying I'm extraordinarily proud to represent the community of Vaughan here in this yeah, legislature, yeah. Speaker. And I look, forward, I look forward to making it very clear to the people of Maple and to the people of Kleinberg and to the people of Southern King over the next 15 months that that leader and that party are opposed to building more transit infrastructure in that community. Speaker. But I will also note, notwithstanding our ambitious plans to continue to build transit in every corner of this province, which that party consistently opposes, I didn't actually hear that member from Kitchener-Conestoga ever say a bad word about our decision to build a station at Breslau in his riding, Speaker. Thanks very much. You seen it, please? Order. Order. No question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our hospitals are facing an overcrowding crisis that keeps getting worse. Last week, 94-year-old Margaret Otto was brought by ambulance to an overcrowded hospital. Margaret had to lie on a stretcher in the busy emergency room for many long hours. It was noisy. She couldn't rest. As her daughter Patricia says, it's pretty sad that a woman of her age in her condition cannot get a hospital room. When will the Premier stop forcing seniors like Margaret to be treated in hallways and do something to solve the overcrowding crisis that they have created. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we have a strategy to address the occupancy, occupancy rates that we see in our, in our hospitals. And it includes increasing our investments in the operating budgets as well as making unprecedented capital investments across this province, Mr. Speaker. Over $10 billion uh, over the next decade in hospital investments. Uh, we've increased the uh, budgets, operating budgets of hospitals last year alone or this fiscal year, Mr. Speaker, by nearly half a billion dollars. Uh, and it's important that Ontarians understand that the vast majority of the hospitals in this province routinely and regularly operate within the less than 100 percent occupancy rate, Mr. Speaker. But we know that there's work to be done. We're proud of the fact that year over year we're seeing from third parties, from Kai Hai, from the Wait Times Alliance, from the Fraser Institute, have found year after year that Ontarians are receiving Answer. timely access to care. They are, we are seeing improvements in ER wait times as well. We know there's more more work to be done. Those are the reasons Thank the you. investments were made. Supplementary. Speaker, patients in Ottawa, like Margaret Otto, are being treated in hallways. Overcrowding has forced the Queensway Carlton Hospital to cancel 36 planned surgery in recent months alone. And it is not just the people of Ottawa who are suffering from overcrowding created by this Liberal government. The Ontario Hospital Association says that emergency room wait time in Ontario are the longest on record. Speaker, this is our Premier's legacy. Overcrowded hospital, seniors on stretcher, cancelled surgery, long wait time for our families across the province. As Margaret's daughter Patricia says, it is a sad state of affair. Nobody can deny it." End of quote. When will this Premier stop squeezing our hospitals Question. and put an end 
to hallway medicine in this province. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it's important that we acknowledge that we have one of the best health care systems uh, in this country, in Mr. World. Speaker, in and the world. in the world. And in fact, Mr. obviously, the yeah. member opposite hasn't read today's uh, Kai Hyatt report, a third party report that. Uh, offers independent third-party proof that our government has made tremendous and it continues to make tremendous progress since 2003 in improving wait times. 85 percent of hip, hip replacements in Ontario are completed within the medical benchmark, 6 percent higher better than the national average, 81 percent of knee replacement within the medical benchmark, 12 percent better than the national average, 99 percent of radiation therapy beginning within the medical benchmark. We also beat the national average on this metric. It's consistent with the Fraser report in the last fall, Mr. Speaker, that showed that our Answer. wait times in ERs are improving. Despite more patients, we're seeing reductions in wait times across the board. Mr. Thank you. Yeah. Your question, the member from the Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yesterday in this House, during debate on the Protecting Patients Act, a member from the official opposition said something extremely concerning. The Conservative member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills made comments critical of a zero-tolerance policy for the sexual abuse of patients. The member said zero-tolerance, he finds that dangerous. The member went on to say that he believes, and I quote, consideration of leniency, of understanding, and of tolerance. I found these statements not only shocking. Usually in preambles, we set the tone for the policy question, and the member has not done that yet. I'm waiting for that, and it better be fast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I found that statement shocking. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please explain to this House what exactly a zero-tolerance policy is and how it will protect patients from sexual abuse? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for giving me the opportunity to respond to this very important question. Let me be as clear as possible. Our government has a zero tolerance policy for sexual abuse. That includes zero tolerance for criminal sexual behavior of any kind, regardless of position title or occupation, our government is committed to protecting the safety and well-being of all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Health, my priority is protecting patients. This is exactly why our government has introduced Bill 87, the Protecting Patients Act. Sexual assault, Mr. Speaker, and all other forms of sexual abuse by anyone, including health professionals, is absolutely and unequivocally unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, zero tolerance means just that. And zero sir? tolerance for any form of sexual abuse of any kind by anyone, period. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Order. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care for the answer. I remember watching in awe the Who Will You Help media campaign and understanding that if you're not speaking out, if you're not helping the victim, the survivor, then you're helping the perpetrator. I'm proud to be part of a government that is standing up for survivors. I'm proud that on this side of the House, we recognize the need for zero tolerance when it comes to sexual abuse and assault. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please update the House on what we are doing to support mm -hmm. survivors of sexual Here. abuse? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of the Status of Women. Mr. Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you've heard, it's vital that we make it clear we have a zero tolerance for sexual abuse and assault in our society. In fact, there's no room for leniency. Speaker, all Ontarians deserve to feel safe, safe from sexual violence and harassment in their communities, workplaces, homes, and schools. But the reality is one in three women will experience some form of violence in their lifetime, and that's unacceptable. That's why we launched It's Never Okay, an action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment. Our Who Will Help and our It's Never Okay campaigns 
challenged existing attitudes and spark discussions in Ontario and around the world. But clearly, more conversations need to be had in this House. That's why we are investing $1.7 million in training Answer. for frontline workers in health education and the community. Speaker, we are supporting people who have experienced sexual assault through programs that build Thank partnerships you. between community and centre. Thank you. New question, member from Bethany Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Um, the government has failed Ontarians suffering from mental health issues in recent months. I just want to point out to our own city of Ottawa, three suicides within 10 months at the Ottawa Detention Centre. One man took his own life, and he had been off suicide watch for less than a day when he took <coughs> his own life. Mr. Speaker, is this Ontar the Ontario that those struggling with mental illness should expect to live in? Thank you, Attorney General. Well, thank you uh, very much, Speaker, for the opportunity to answer this very important question. Uh, speaker, I can, I can tell the member opposite and all the members of this House that our government is very much focused on making sure that we've got the right kind of support uh, for individuals with mental health and addiction uh, services. I know uh, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services uh, is very much focused in ensuring that we have uh, appropriate training for our correctional officers uh, uh, around mental health, that we have specialized nurses uh, in our correctional facilities uh, that have uh, training uh, around mental health so that those services can be provided. And the work that is being done, Speaker, through uh, Mr. Howard uh, Sapers, who's the former correctional investigator uh, from the federal government, is very much focused around um, ensuring that we uh, when it comes to dealing with issues around segregation, that there are appropriate uh, services uh, uh, available. Uh, that work is ongoing in consultation with the Ministry of Health so that we have robust services for mental Thank health you. in our correctional facilities. Supplementary. What concerns me is that clearly the supports and the services aren't there. One individual, and I quote, was only in the detention center because there was no bed available at the Ottawa, Royal Ottawa Mental Health Center, which is where he was supposed to be undergoing the assessment. Uh, the government cuts and neglect of mental health is heartbreaking. Um, I just want to ask the minister, how many more deaths will it take before the government shows real concrete action with clear supports and clear services for those suffering? Thank you. Uh, Speaker, our government con continues to make investments in making sure that we've got appropriate supports available, uh, not only in our correctional facilities when it comes to supports for mental health, but also uh, at the community level. The work that my ministry is, is doing through our bail action plan is very much focused on ensuring that we've got appropriate mental health supports available in the community. By working with organizations like in Ottawa, with John Howard Society, we are making sure, Speaker, that we've got more mental health workers at a community level so those individuals who are low risk or, or vulnerable are, are not being remanded uh, to the Ottawa Carlton Detention Centre, but in fact they've been released under supervision in the community so that they can get appropriate support. We have also, uh, Speaker, have launched a groundbreaking bail, bail beds program. Yes, Ottawa sir. is one of the sites with 20 beds, both for men and women, that will ensure that uh, those uh, accused with complex needs get the appropriate mental health care in the community. Thank you. Question, member from Waller. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Cafeteria staff at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus have been on strike for more than six weeks. They want fairness, they want better schedules, they want better benefits, and they want wages that they can actually live on. Cafeteria workers at York University were able to win a raise, bringing them to $15 an hour. They achieved this, Speaker, with no help from the government. Hardworking Ontarians and businesses have waited long enough for change. You've received the submissions for the Changing Workplaces Review. The report's done. Where is it? Speaker, what is this government prepared to do to transform the lives of these cafeteria workers and all hardworking Ontarians, and when? Eric. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question. Speaker, when there's, a, when there's a labor dispute, Speaker, the government focuses and the Ministry of Labor focuses on assisting both of that part, those parties that want to reach an agreement, Speaker. They assist them with the process. It's a shared responsibility, Speaker. Right. We've got some of the best mediators. We've got some of the best conciliators, Speaker, in the country right here with the Ministry of Labor. And they've got a tremendous record, Speaker, of drawing parties together, bringing them in and eventually reaching um, agreement, Speaker. So we actively encourage the employer 
in this case and the union in this case, Speaker, to make every effort they possibly can to resolve those issues where they should be resolved, Speaker. That's and correct. that's at the bargaining table, Speaker. We're confident if those people bring their best to that table, Speaker, that these parties can reach a settlement that's in the best interest of the institution and the people that work there, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I would then say, Speaker, to the Labour Minister, why are these people who are making just over minimum wage still on strike? Yeah. Speaker, do Democrats believe that $15 an hour should be the minimum that Ontarians receive for the hard work that they do? And they shouldn't have to strike to get it. We believe that people should be able to plan their lives with better schedules, with better wages, and without being able to take time off for sick leave without breaking the bank. Speaker again, what is the government prepared to do for these cafeteria workers and for all hardworking Ontarians, and when? Minister. Speaker, thank you. I don't think this government needs to take any lessons from the third party on how to resolve labour disputes. Speaker. We've got the changing workplaces underway. We've been doing it for two years. Speaker. The report is almost ready. It's going to reach this House. Speaker. The examination that's been done of these issues has simply has not been done in the province of Ontario before. Speaker. 98 per cent of labour disputes in this province speaker, are resolved without a strike, without a lockout. When the NDP were in power, Speaker, when the NDP were in power, almost a million days a year lost, Speaker. So, does anybody going to give anybody lessons on how the collective bargaining process should work, Speaker? It would not be that party. I look forward to the input, to the input from the third party when the changing workplaces review is made public, which will be in a very short time. They'll have an opportunity to speak out then, like they should have when we had the minimum wage debate here. New question, the member from Barry. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Minister, Ontario depends on the goodwill of volunteers to deliver vital services and build strong, inclusive communities. In my riding of Barrie, a number of constituents have received recognition through your ministry for the outstanding work that they do. Mr. Speaker, the fu function of the Honours and Awards Secretariat is integral to the recognizing Ontario across the province for contributing their time to local organizations, right. such as the Stroke Recovery Association of Barrie and assisting local community initiatives like Season Centre for Grieving Children, which provides peer-to-peer -peer support for children that are grieving the death of an immediate family member. Oh. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about how the Government of Ontario recognizes the outstanding Question. accomplishments and achievements of our volunteers. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I would like, first of all, to thank the member from uh, Barrie for championing volunteers in her community. Each year, more than 12,500 volunteers are celebrated in wow. Ontario through five honours and 12 recognition programs administered by the Honours and Awards Secretariat. One of the province's highest honour is the Order of Ontario. Last December, 26 individuals were appointed to the Order of Ontario by the Honourable Elizabeth Dowdswell, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Recipients include outstanding individuals such as sprinter Donovan Bailey, wow. who won two gold medals at the 1996 Summer wow. Olympics, and Lisa Laflamme, Answer. the anchor of Canada CTV National News. Mr. Speaker, honours and awards are essential in reflecting the commitment uh, of, and conviction of volunteers Thank who you. have a vision for a stronger Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for her answer. Minister, each year Ontarians benefit from the efforts of approximately 4.9 million volunteers. In my riding of Barrie, a large number of my constituents rely on volunteers to deliver vital services, such as providing support to patients recovering from a stroke. Mr. Speaker, I know that in the past, Royal Victoria Regional Health Centre Auxiliary of Barrie, with over 800 volunteers led by Janice Williams, had access to program through the ministry to acknowledge volunteers for their enhancement of patient care. I'm sure the minister would agree that it is important to recognize and thank these organizations and individuals that represent the best of our province. Speaker, can the minister inform this House about the programs that recognize the outstanding contributions of volunteers in our community? Thank you, Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I again want to thank the member from Barrie. The member is correct. Through our volunteer service awards, both adults and youth are recognized for the length of time that they volunteered for an organization. Last year, 2,200 organizations, including the Berry Art Club, uh, accessed our program. More than 11,000 volunteers were recognized at 54 different ceremonies across the province. Mr. Speaker, this year, from March to June, more than 50 ceremonies are being held throughout Ontario in communities uh, that, to celebrate the contribution of our volunteers. I have written to every member of this House with the detailed information about the local ceremonies, and I encourage them to get engaged. It is through these programs that we are able to recognize volunteers Sir. across our province for their contribution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, your question, the member from Thornhill. Here. Thank you very much. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, the area around Branson Hospital has a high concentration of elderly residents, so so it's clear that the Branson site should focus on senior care and include specialty clinics, outpatient mental health services, medical walk and assessment services, day programs for elderly people, and multidisciplinary health promotion and health maintenance programs for local communities. Shockingly and sadly, the urgent care centre at Branson is scheduled to close this June. Mr. Speaker, how can this government turn its back on these seniors? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it was, was it Branson? Yeah, it wasn't Branson. Brampton. Thank you. Uh, I just require that clarification. I'm not familiar with this specific uh, situation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but uh, on the one hand, I'm happy to talk to the member opposite to, uh, to get informed, to have a closer understanding. I'll be doing the same with my staff and the ministry uh, over the course of the day. Uh, clearly, Mr. Speaker, we provide the opportunity for our local communities to uh, and our local hospitals uh, and those that govern them to make uh, decisions based on the priorities and the needs of the local community. Uh, it's critically important that as they make those decisions, they uh, are able to provide that confidence and those assurances to the community that those services that they rely on are going to be provided. Again, I'm not uh, familiar with this specific situation. Perhaps I'll get more information in the supplementary. Even better, Mr. Speaker, yes, I'd suggest uh, a conversation so perhaps we could work together to resolve this in a satisfactory way. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to discuss it further. I understand that Councillor James Pasternak is going to be speaking to Toronto City Council about the issue, so I thought the minister would be aware. There are concerns that North York General Hospital does not have room to absorb all the services presently provided to the community at Branson Hospital, even if the elderly could make the trip. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario government actually promised medical services to be provided specifically to seniors in this area just south of my riding of Thornhill. In addition to seniors, the Branson neighbourhood has a high concentration of new Canadians who value the health care provided at the Branson site. Will the minister promise today to look into the matter and to ensure that the seniors, new Canadians and the rest of the residents of the Branson area in northern Toronto will not be losing their cherished medical services? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so as uh, the member knows, this is, uh, uh, this is part of North York General Hospital. Uh, my understanding from my staff is that uh, the lease on this particular facility for Branson Ambulatory uh, is uh, due to expire in 2019. But I'm also told by my staff just now, Mr. Speaker, that uh, there's a confidence that there will be no service loss expected uh, as a result of these changes. Thank you. New question, the member from Alboma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. This Liberal government has claimed for years to be lobbying Ottawa to match its $1 billion promise to invest in a transportation corridor to the Ring of Fire development. Yet Liberal Nickel Belt MP Mark Serre is quoted this week as saying, the Feds can't do anything until the province has a road plan, saying, and I quote, as of today, I haven't seen a road plan. It's hard to invest on a blank piece of paper, we need a plan. Wow. Well, Speaker, who's right and where's the plan? Wow. Speaker, Northern Development and Mines. 
Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I um, appreciate the question from the member. The member is right when he recognizes that on this side of the House, our government has consistently put a significant allocation on the table related to infrastructure build-out in the Ring of Fire. The number is $1 billion. Speaker. It's a significant commitment to moving forward with development in the Ring of Fire area. And I would mention to the member that I remember very well in the election of 2014, where the Ring of Fire was not even mentioned in the NDP platform that first came out when they were rushing forward to take us to the polls. Speaker, we continue to work on the file in a very significant way. I understand the member may be trying to link this back to the federal budget that we had come out last week uh, that, in his mind, I suppose, did not directly in, uh, reference investment in the Reagan fire, but absolutely, Speaker, we believe at some point there will be an opportunity here for the federal government to play a role in Ringer fire uh, development. We're counting on it, and we would expect at some Answer. point that they will come forward with support. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, when you invest money to develop natural resources in the north, the entire benef the province benefits from this investment. This Liberal government has been talking about the Ring of Fire for years, but nothing, nothing you have to show for it. When, this government, when is this government going to stop announcing development in the Ring of Fire and actually start developing the Ring of Fire? Speaker, one of the, uh, the pieces that has seen some progress, I would uh, reference, is that there was a corridor study completed not that long ago. And um, while there was not a definitive link or route established through that corridor study, it's my understanding that that work did yield significant information that will position us well as we move forward on this particular file in terms of finally defining a particular route. There is some action considered and progress further required, where they want to see a secondary study completed. It's my understanding that the first study was very informative in terms of what it yielded, and as well, Speaker, will help us as we move forward with providing community access roads to four or five of the First Nations communities that will ultimately be able to tie in to an east-west corridor if that is ultimately the route that is chosen on the road. Yes, work is ongoing, Speaker. Progress is being made, and we look forward to the work to continue. Thank you. New question. The member from Beaches is your well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Research, Research, Innovation and Science. Now, Speaker, members in this House know full well how important it is that we embrace manufacturing processes that are less harmful for the environment. And I don't think it's any secret that many consumers in Ontario are switching to products, products that are low carbon, and we must support the companies that are investing and innovating these new products. Embracing clean tech has multiple benefits for our society. It lessens the damage it has done to the environment by harmful manufacturing processes, and a healthier habitat reduces health-related issues, as well as new technologies will increase the size of the sector, create new companies and jobs, adding to our already stellar GDP growth. It's obvious that this sector is important to Ontario's future and all of our children's futures. So, Speaker, I ask, will the minister Question. please let the members of this House know about his plans to grow Ontario's clean tech sector? Mr. Research, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Peaches East York for that very good question. Mr. Speaker, the member is right on all accounts. Clean tech is a sector in Ontario that is capable of enormous growth, Mr. Speaker. To support that sector, our 2016 budget announced a $55 million investment to establish the Clean Tech Equity Fund, which will be funded through our business growth initiative. Mr. Speaker, this investment will help develop emerging clean tech companies by ensuring innovative firms have the access to capital they need to scale up, hire talent, and export globally. I am glad to see the federal government following provincial lead, Mr. Speaker, announced a $380 million clean tech equity fund in their 2017 budget. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the minister. The work that he is doing to advance innovation in Ontario is absolutely outstanding, worthy of a doctor of physics. <laughs> now, the news is fantastic, Speaker, because it is more important than ever in Ontario to foster foster the right investment climate to turn local innovation into scaled-up companies and high-quality jobs. And I know that Clean Tech North, which is chaired by Brian Watson, a Beaches East York constituent, appreciates our vision. And it's great to see that the government is investing in a business sector that can have a direct impact on all Ontarians' day-to-day -day lives. 
The growth of this sector will allow people to make more environmentally conscious decisions, decisions that consumers can feel good about. So will the minister please tell the House more about the clean tech sector in Ontario and more about what the government is to do, doing to support the sector? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from Beaches York for that question. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the member is correct. Ontario is home to the largest and the fastest growing clean tech sector in our country, Canada. Ontario's clean tech sector, Mr. Speaker, is responsible for $8 billion in revenue and employs over 64,000 people in 3,000 companies across our province. Clean tech in Ontario is a sector of great strategic importance. It has the capacity to generate revenue and to help mitigate environmental damages. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's highly skilled workforce, vibrant innovation and tech clusters, and the geographic position gives us a great competitive edge over our other jurisdictions. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to invest in our clean tech sector as one of the leaders in our innovative economy. Thank, Answer, you. thank you. New question, the member from Niagara West Lambert. Yes, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Tonight, the Niagara District School Board will be voting on whether or not to close down Beansville District Secondary Shameful. School, South Lincoln High School, and Grimsby Secondary wow. School. Closing these schools would leave enormous holes in the communities of Lincoln, Grimsby, and West Lincoln. But there's still time to do the right thing and listen to the parents, yes. teachers, and children in Niagara. My question to the Minister of Education is this. Will her ministry put a moratorium on the closure the of right small thing, and rural Minister. schools across Ontario until the accommodation review is fixed and the funding formula is amended? Good question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite for this question. Mr. Speaker, as I've said in this House as recently as yesterday, an arbitrary moratorium is not um, the approach, Mr. Speaker. There is no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to our local schools. And, Mr. Speaker, we believe in our locally elected school boards because, Mr. Speaker, they understand the needs in their local communities. We we put in place an accommodation review processes that requires school boards to consult with the school community, Mr. Speaker, and that includes with their local municipalities, right. with their coterminous co boards, with students, with parents, so that they get these locally made decisions right. Answer. Mr. Speaker, this is about ensuring that local, the locally elected school boards do what is in the best interest of their local schools. Here. Supplementary. Speaker, my question is back to the Minister of Education. Perhaps the minister won't listen to the constituents in my riding, but if she's not going to do the right thing in my riding, perhaps she will listen to the students and parents from the rest of Ontario. Small and rural schools are the backbones of local communities and economies. Students and parents across the province are rightly anxious about the radical ongoing closures. This Liberal government seems to be doing everything it can to balance their books on the backs of rural schools and yep. their students. So my, my question is back to the Minister of Education. When will this government stop trying to balance the budget on the backs of rural students? Good question. Mr. Speaker, we know that uh, schools play a vital role in the social fabric that ties our great communities together. And Mr. Speaker, I want to say to the member opposite that we are continuing to invest in our schools, and our local uh, schools are, are really the, the, the centre of our communities. We have uh, increased the funding to schools by 59 per cent since 2003, Mr. Speaker. I want to also point out in the member's own riding, we have invested in 12 new and improved schools wow. since 2003. So let me bring to the member's attention that $8.9 million was spent to build the new 20 Valley Public School, $11.3 million to build a new Binbrook School, and $1.5 million for new childcare spaces. And Mr. Speaker, I can go on with the list of 12 new schools in that member's own riding because we believe in investing in Public yeah. education here. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week in London, I met with four families of adults living with severe physical disability who are in dire need of residential care after suffering stroke or traumatic brain injury. Two of these men are living in hospital, one is living in a retirement home, and one is living at home with his aging and unwell mother, with long-term care his next and only option. Speaker, these families are desperate and exhausted. They have written to the Minister of Health, they have written to the Deputy Premier, they have met with the South West Lynn and with the patient ombudsman. But the wait lists for assisted living are so long, their loved ones are more likely to die than make it to the top of the list. What does the Premier want me to tell these families? Minister of Community and Social Services. Sir, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the types of cases that uh, the member opposite is describing are some of the most challenging. I think we can acknowledge this. There are complex me uh, medical issues in a number of these cases. Occasionally, there is uh, mental health overlay, dual diagnosis, and so on. And uh, for the safety of all concerned, on some occasions, individuals do need the type of support that they will receive in a long-term care facility or other uh, type of uh, environment. Uh, we know that uh, sometimes there are aging parents involved in these situations, and we know that uh, uh, they need the kind of support uh, that is appropriate for their loved ones. Um, in terms of uh, uh, specify or talking about these specific cases, obviously I cannot do that, but we are Answer. certainly aware that uh, we need more supports in appropriate settings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. In the London area, there are about 500 adults on the waiting list for Cheshire Homes, 50 on the Dale Brain Injury Services wait list for housing supports, and as many as 90 on the housing wait list at Participation House. They are waiting for Lynn-funded dollars to support their medical needs. The lack of assisted living options is creating a crisis for families. It is forcing the permanent hospitalization of people who want to live in their communities. It is trapping people who are in the prime of their lives inappropriately in nursing homes. Will the Premier commit today to increasing the number of assisted living placements in the Southwest Lynn so that these adults and others like them with complex medical needs can live with dignity in the kind of housing they deserve? Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Health, long-term care. Uh, these individual cases remind us of just how uh, important it is that we harness all the resources possible to provide them with the respect and dignity and the supports that they require to live as full and independent and beneficial lives to themselves and being part of their communities. So we know that there's more work to be done. There has, I think the member opposite would uh, acknowledge, and she referenced two organizations as well, Participation House and Cheshire Homes, that have made extraordinary impacts in, in that process in association with other community organizations. Uh, there is a role to be played by multiple partners when we talk about assisted living as well and the support of housing that's required. Uh, I'm certainly uh, I will take this, uh, these examples, uh, and I know that there is a role yes, for our lens as well to see how we might be able to make a difference in these particular instances, but also more generally, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Speaker, for many people who are living on low incomes, learning financial literacy skills is a very important step in becoming more secure and independent. Organizations like the Working Centre in my riding of Kitchener Centre are playing a crucial role in teaching financial education, and they're providing support services for some of Ontario's most vulnerable people. I joined the minister recently uh, in my riding as she announced a further four years of funding to organizations like the Working Centre through the Financial Empowerment and Problem Solving Program. Speaker, could the minister please give us an update on how this investment is helping build financial literacy among low-income Ontarians? 
Thank you, Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member from Kitchener Centre for her question. My ministry and this government know that for many people living on low incomes, financial literacy is an important step in becoming more financially secure. And that is why last year our government made an initial investment of $1.5 million in Prosper Canada, and why I recently announced an additional $8 million over the next five years to continue providing programs that promote financial financial literacy. Our investment will make it possible for agencies to continue the already successful financial empowerment and problem-solving program. Speaker, this program has already assisted almost 16,000 individuals in just two years. Individuals have benefited from services such as tax clinics that help people prepare and maximize their tax returns, thereby increasing access to tax benefits for low-income individuals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The time for question period has ended, therefore there are no deferred votes, therefore this house stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.